said, well, who's got the gun? And she said, Michael. And then at that point, that's when I knew that I'd been shot and I couldn't believe that it was him. In hindsight, you can kind of see it coming. But um, before the day, no. I, I couldn't have, um, I wouldn't have put that kind of evil in it. It's 1997. Paducah, Kentucky is a place Missy and Mandy Jenkins have always felt safe. A postcard picture of a town in America's Bible Belt. I really liked Paducah and I loved growing up there. I think I felt like I had everything that I wanted. Everybody knows everyone. Um, everybody is good friends with each other. I love living here because it's big enough, but it's small enough too. Me and my twin sister, we're best friends. We've lived in this house our whole life. We have neighborhood friends that we played with all the time growing up. There was always something to do, and we just, I had a wonderful childhood. Local reporter Bill Bartleman knows the charm of this Kentucky town better than anybody. I think Paducah, Kentucky is a very interesting town. It's a very friendly town. Uh, I came here with the intent of staying one year. I've been here 35 or 36 years. For the young people of Paducah, that community spirit centers around one place, Heath High School. It's 1997, and the Jenkins sisters are returning there for their sophomore year. Heath definitely has a, a good community feeling, um, a good spirit to it. I really enjoyed going there and, and made a lot of friends there. The Heath community is deeply religious, and each morning, students come together for a prayer circle to start their school day. Power and glory, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Prayer circle was something that meant a lot to us. It was something that kind of helped us start off our morning. As the girls head back for their second year of high school, their friend Michael Carneal is about to start his freshman year. Oh. <laughs> Always the class clown, Michael can be counted on for a good laugh. I knew Michael Carneal really well. We went to elementary school together. We were in middle school together. He was a year younger than Missy and I. We saw each other every day. We were in the band together. And he was a really, really funny guy. There's one time he uh, wore a twister board as a cape and ran around and uh, just making people laugh, just doing stu stupid, silly stuff. Oh, really? Again. But now, as Michael enters high school, he begins to realize that he's a small fish in a much bigger pond. At his new school, not everyone is a fan of Michael's pranks. A lot of people thought Michael was not so funny, that he was annoying. A lot of them just ended up making fun of him or thinking things that he said were stupid. But Michael's problem may be more than just an issue of trying to fit in. During his last weeks of junior high, Michael is marred by an incident that makes him the target of a cruel joke. In the rumor has it section of the paper, someone had said that he was gay. At the time when I heard that, you know, it wasn't as effective to me as it is now. Now I realize, wow, that was probably absolutely devastating and upsetting. Knowing him, I think that he probably laughed it off and said, hey, that's not true. But apparently inside, it hurt him a lot worse than he let others believe. The abuse Michael is enduring triggers a switch. Michael becomes more aggressive. And some students even peg Michael as a bully. About two weeks before the shooting occurred, Michael Carneal uh, went to his father's closet and found a handgun. He put that handgun in his backpack and took it to school with him. Is that thing real? Yeah. Loaded? He showed it to a friend of his and said, what do you think of this? Jesus, what a gun to school. 
And the students say, well, you better put it back and you better not bring it back again. You're going to get caught. After weeks of abuse, Michael isn't trying to make his classmates laugh anymore. Missy recalls noticing a change in her friend. We were at a birthday party together, and he uh, was seemed more serious than, than he ever had been. He was always somebody that I saw um, as funny and that I never saw him serious, but he didn't seem as funny or outgoing then. Michael, in his own way, begins to warn people that he has a plan. My friend Eric actually heard from Michael that something big was going to happen. But the way Michael was, he joked all the time. So Eric just laughed it off and said, whatever. You know, you're not going to do anything. You know, nothing big's going to happen. You know, you're just little Michael, you know. Didn't think anything of it, you know. No one could imagine just how serious the class clown was about to get. And I see one of my own students standing there with a pistol, and he's shooting kids right in front of him. Kids were on the floor, bleeding to death. High school freshman and former class clown, Michael Carneal, is tired of being the butt of everyone's jokes. Despite some obvious warnings, nobody takes him seriously. On Thanksgiving Day, he had Thanksgiving with his parents and grandparents. They all came over to the house. They had their meal. And then Michael wanted to go ride his bike. Michael rode his bike to a neighbor's house, and he broke into a garage where some guns were stored. He brought the guns wrapped in a blanket into his bedroom. He took a handgun stolen from another neighbor and shoved it into his school bag. While he was in there doing that, his father knocked on his door and said, Michael, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm getting ready uh, for a project for school. It's Monday morning. Michael leaves for school, and no one in his family knows what's in the strange package that he's carrying. He told his sister that it was a project of some kind. She had no reason to believe it was anything other than the science project. He didn't say anything, didn't act unusual, didn't say anything to her to indicate he was planning something big. It was a typical day. Our father, Kids were coming in the building. Everything was fine and cool. You did, had no sense about what was fixing to happen or what could happen. Deliver us from evil. Missy and Mandy take their usual spots at the prayer circle next to their friend, Casey Steger. Kelly Aslep is also part of the morning ritual. We all um, stood in the circle, and Casey was holding my left hand, and Missy was holding my right. By now, Michael has arrived at school with his project under his arm. One of the teachers said, what do you got there, Michael? He said, well, it's my art project. And in hindsight, they realized it didn't look like an art project, but they had no reason to disbelieve him because Michael was not a troublemaker. He was never in trouble. Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom comes, the will be done. Absorbed in their prayers, no one sees Michael Carneal enter with a large package. No one sees him calmly stick an earplug in each ear. It is not into temptation. And no one sees him pull out a 22 caliber gun. Until it is too late. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Same time tomorrow, guys. Yeah. And as we started walking away, I started hearing popping noises. It sounded like firecrackers. I probably got two steps in, and I heard pop, pop. And I stepped again, and I was hit. I didn't really think at the time, you know, 
Somebody's, somebody has a gun. I thought, you know, where are these firecrackers at? I looked to my left and I saw a girl um, get shot in the head and she fell to the ground. That girl is Kelly Aslett. She's felled by a shot to the neck. I saw the blood. I thought it was fake. And for some reason, I kept telling myself that this is a joke, this isn't real. The main thing I saw was the gun, and it seemed like almost in slow motion, there was like a yellow hue around the gun with each shot. I didn't even feel the gunshot. It hit me. I had no clue where, didn't even know I was hit. My entire body went numb, like my hearing was gone too. It was just all of a sudden my hearing was gone and I, I, my entire body just floated down to the ground. There were people screaming and, and people crying and people yelling and then I just remember looking back at Missy and she was laying funny on the ground. So I crawled over to her and I leaned over her my sister's laying there on the ground, and I just asked to her, you know, Missy, are you okay? And she said she can't feel her stomach. Missy needs medical help fast, but Michael Carneal is still in control with five guns and almost a thousand rounds of ammo left to go. After opening fire on a group of students in the lobby of Heath High, Michael Carneal is still on the loose. Several students have been hit by gunfire. And Principal Bill Bond now arrives on the scene. Now I hear pow, pow, pow. And I see one of my own students standing there with a pistol, and he's shooting kids right in front of him. Kids were on the floor, bleeding to death. Sisters Missy and Mandy are huddled together, hoping to make it out alive. Missy is wounded, but doesn't know how badly. Mandy's sitting there staring, looking at something. At that point, I said, well, who's got the gun? And she said, Michael. And I couldn't believe that it was him. After firing 10 shots, Michael finally stops. Everyone waits, fearful of what he'll do next. He had a blank look on his face, I remember when I saw him. No expression. Principal Bond knows this is his chance. When there was a, a break in the rhythm of the gunfire, I started towards him. When you are approaching a person with a gun, you honestly don't see anything but the gun. You don't see anything else going on. You don't see the person holding the gun. You can only see the gun. I picked the gun up, and I called him by name and told him to go to the office. He didn't get any more expression on his face than if I'd have just caught him smoking in a boy's bathroom. There was, he was just emotionless. Carneal is disarmed without incident. In the foyer, dazed students tried to piece together what just happened. I wasn't feeling anything. I could not move any part of the lower part of my body. There was blood all over my back. So they, were, they said, yep, she's injured. So they wrapped me up in a blanket and kind of left me. Um, and that's when um, I started thinking about, well, where's, where's Missy, where's Casey? Bleeding and in shock, Kelly makes her way over to help her best friend, Casey. Her hood had flipped up over her head. You know, she's lying face down on the ground. And um, I was like, Casey, what are you doing, Casey? And, you know, she didn't say anything. And um, 
so I turned her over. I grabbed her shoulder and turned her, and then I started screaming. Blood is gushing from Casey's neck. The Kraken County Sheriff John Hayden is called to the scene. It was just total, total chaos. Uh, when I pulled up at the school, the lobby of the school, it was just a horrifying experience to look at that and, and to think what those children, um, what, what they went through, what was going through their minds when this was occurring. Some of the walls were riddled with bullet holes, and it was very, very, uh, it was a very solemn experience for me. And um, it just looked, really looked like a war zone. At the hospital, doctors determined that Missy is permanently paralyzed from the chest down. Seeing my family when they came to see me in the emergency room was really hard because when they came in, they were so worried about me. They were crying. I can remember my grandma crying, and I told my grandma, I'm OK. I'm fine. I, I'm, I'm just paralyzed. I'm, I'm OK. I'm alive. Other victims were not as lucky as Missy. In the hours following the shooting, two more girls die, bringing the death toll to three. With Michael now in police custody, all of Paducah is wondering one thing, why? There were a lot of psychological reports done on Michael Carneal, done both by the prosecutors and done on behalf of Michael. And they found he did have some mental problems. Paducah residents are slowly putting back together the pieces of their lives after Michael Carneal's shooting rampage at Heath High. He is charged with burglary, three counts of murder, and five counts of attempted murder. With so many witnesses, there's no question of Michael's guilt. But the question remains, what turned this class clown into a callous killer? There were a lot of psychological reports done on Michael Carneal, done both by the prosecutors and done on behalf of Michael. And they found he did have some mental problems. But some who know Michael see a colder kind of calculation behind his rampage. I'm not God, I'm not in the forgiving business. When he came in there with those five guns and started killing people, he didn't shoot anyone who had ever caused him any harm. He never, none of the kids that he shot had ever said anything negative to him. The kids he shot represented the best and the brightest in school. And, and I feel like that's what he was striking out, out at, the best and the brightest. After much deliberation, Michael cops a plea, guilty by reasons of insanity. His victims face him for the first time in a year at the sentence hearing. How do you lead? Guilty but mentally ill. The day that Michael Carneal was sentenced was a very emotional for everybody involved. I think there were probably tears in the eyes of everybody from the judge on down to the spectator in the back row of the courtroom. I was very emotional. Um, it took me about, I didn't have anything written down. Um, it took me probably five solid minutes to speak. I was the last one to see the girl I grew up with and was best friends with. This was going to be the first time that I ever got a chance to actually look at him face to face and to talk to him. And and that's one of the things I said was, I wanted, I wanted Michael to look at me if he wants to. And he did look at me. Okay. When he was staring at me and I was speaking to him, I really felt like he was listening to me because I talked to him the way I'm talking to you right now. I didn't yell and scream at him because I knew that yelling and screaming wasn't going to help anything. I don't have any hard feelings towards you. I'm, I'm just upset that this happened. I told him, I'm not forgiving you. I don't care if you're sorry. You should have thought of that before you even did it. You, you I know that's the thing that everybody wants you to do, but I don't forgive you. I. I wish it, you know, I wish you would get the death penalty. 
Michael does not get the death penalty, but three consecutive life sentences with no chance of parole for 25 years. Once in prison, he is diagnosed and treated for schizophrenia. But does a mental illness justify his heinous acts? He did kill three people. He injured five and changed a lot of people's lives that day. I wasn't angry at Michael. Why? I'm not really sure, but I feel like I, I was just able to easily forgive him. I could take two roads. I could either be angry at him and have all this anger in my heart, and that would definitely not help me move on with my life. It wouldn't help me walk again. Why be angry? Today, Missy works as a school counselor, dealing with troubled kids and victims of bullying. She's happily married with a baby on the way. And despite all she's been through, she knows that she is one of the lucky ones. One thing I've learned is that, you know, never to take things for granted because you never know when they're going to be gone. And then also I've realized how important my future is. I needed to make whatever I could out of myself because I got a second chance out of life.